this is likely not news to anybody familiar with the show enough to click on this video, but the way the Steven Universe was aired, especially towards the end, had several not so great consequences. And while the most obvious and well remembered of these were the absurd hiatuses, I think the way that it affected discussion of the show was arguably equally impactful. See, when an episode like A Single Pale Rose, 11 minutes that fundamentally changed the show we've been watching for half a decade, is aired on the same night as a different quarter hour, well, it's easy to understand how the latter could get overshadowed. And that's exactly what happened to Can't Go Back. And while nothing in this episode is as discussable, I guess, as the reveal of Rose's past, there's still a good bit here to, somewhat ironically given the title, go back to. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. In this video, we're going to explore all the things this final Lapis Lazuli focused episode does for her character, as well as the terrific twist that scheduling ultimately took from us. One, why didn't you tell me about your moon base? Two, take me to your moon base. Three, why does it look like a barn? Besides a quick glimpse at Peridot, depressingly letting water drip onto her gem, perhaps to remind her of who she's lost, Can't Go Back kicks off with Ronaldo, just like everything else great in life. And while it is only inevitable that I eventually make an In Defense of Ronaldo video, his appearance in this one is ultimately more or less just to set the plot in motion, causing Steven to notice the barn on the moon, and ultimately, Lapis along with it. To somewhat set up the Lapis Lazuli of this episode, since we first saw the character in her truly terrific introduction episode, her arc had been shaky at best. There are some really good episodes along the way, with both Chilliteed and Alone at Sea being these ultra-fascinating dissections of her relationship with Jasper, but the truth is, the less traumatic of a situation that Lapis gets into, the less interesting of a character she becomes. It's hard to argue against the fact that, as contrived as it honestly is, the fear that we see in the character in Raising the Barn does give her the wrinkle she'd been missing for quite a bit. Watching her see seemingly shed all character development at the first sign of Diamond Trouble was something that genuinely didn't feel like anything else in the universe had done to that point, a consequence of her unimaginable trauma that somewhat goes against the character improvement pattern of the series. And while I do understand why some fans find this part of her story frustrating, I see it more as the show understanding that, while Steven did help Lapis, he can't undo thousands of years of trauma with some nice words and a song or two. Anyway, we'll circle back to all of those ideas in a second, but first, let's go ahead and get to the Lapis of this episode, who reveals that, during her journey to get as far from Earth as possible, she began to regret her decision, instead setting up camp on the moon, and ultimately setting up one of my favorite audiovisual moments that the series ever gives us. As Lapis shows Steven, she's been spending her time on Earth's satellite using the moon base's observation orb to keep tabs on her friends back on the planet, and the way it's portrayed to the audience just works so damn well. I'll hopefully be playing the music from the scene right now if copyright will allow, but the way that it comes together, both with the lack of any other sound as well as the contrasting shadow of Lapis, creates this scene that somehow manages to be completely surreal without feeling creepy, but instead just so sad. I'd go ahead and touch on the themes of the scene now, but the feelings of isolation portrayed here are what Lapis describes in her song. So I'm going to go ahead and tie the lyrics of That Distant Shore to why this scene succeeds so tremendously at portraying this feeling. As she sings in what becomes this generally really impressive tune, Lapis describes the pure joy of having a real family for the first time in her life, and how, at the first sign of possibly losing it, 
she just freaks out. Sure, all the other gems hypothetically understand what it'll be like if the diamonds come back and wreck everything, but Lapis knows exactly what it'll be like, and it's that discrepancy that drives her to leave. For the first time in her life, Lapis has something worth living for, and she just doesn't understand how everybody else around her can ignore the possibility of losing it. And of course, all of this brings us back to what Lapis has been spending her time doing, wishing that she still had the life she fled from and getting as close to it as she comfortably can, which isn't very close at all. She's stuck watching from afar, imagining what's being said by those she cares about and feeling miserable that she'll never know. As she tells Steven, Lapis just couldn't deal with not knowing if and when her perfect life was going to be taken, so she deals with it by taking it from herself. Of course, upon hearing all of this, Steven asks the obvious question, why can't she just come back? And while Lapis does kind of answer this, really twice as once before the song and once after, her responses are kind of all over the place. She tells Steven that she's worried that the one she's left behind will be upset, that things will never be the same, that the diamond still may show up at any moment, but I think the actual answer is something slightly different. Sure, I do think her explanations have some merit, and they tie a bit into a theme of the episode that I'll cycle back to at the end of the video, but I really think all of this, at least at this point, goes back to something that Lapis actually told Steven pretty early on in this conversation. She's terrified of the unknown. This is an idea that's been touched on a good bit throughout her story, especially in episodes like Alone at Sea, but as horrible as Lapis's experiences in the past have been, she's still finding herself missing parts of them. Despite just how miserable her time was in both the Mirror and Malachite, it was predictable misery. Every day she knew what was ahead, something that her new life on Earth just can't provide. It's a pretty depressing angle of her character, one of her being so accustomed to hopelessness that she just can't tolerate the alternative, and it makes her actions in this episode more understandable. Even though Steven is able to make her reminisce about the positives of life on Earth, it only takes one mention of the diamonds, one mention of the thing she just can't control, for her to immediately grasp onto the predictability of a solitary life in space. And while I do understand that it's a bit frustrating that this moment comes through a misconception, with Steven just incoherently talking about his dream until she's freaked out, I really don't think that it matters. Lapis being afraid of the diamonds was never an irrational fear, and she wasn't going to return to Earth until she conquers it. We'll get back to Lapis in a second, but first, we gotta talk about the pink diamond stuff here, which is, while somewhat disconnected from everything else outside of the clever reuse of the shadow motif, just so, so well done. Blue Diamond being the only voice here both allows for yellow silence to be immensely menacing, while pink silence is representative of how she feels unheard. The music is one of the best examples of the general homeworld unease that these scenes tend to have, and yet still, all of that pales in comparison to the slow reveal of Pearl's involvement in this shattering. Her slow and methodical approach becoming more and more horrifying, with the audience being slightly ahead of Steven only adding to this feeling, only for the scene to, instead of finishing with her slicing pink or cutting back to Steven, ends with Pearl looking at both Steven and the viewer, as our entire understanding of her, Rose Quartz, and Pink Diamond immediately crumbles. It's this clever twist that, while ultimately proven to be misleading at best, just completely recontextualizes how the audience was led to believe that Pink was shattered, framing Pearl as this killer that we had already so easily categorized Rose as. And while there is a brief intermission after this to let Lapis run away again, 
again, the show then arguably hits us with the actual biggest twist of the episode. I'm being a bit facetious here, but seriously, in a series where Steven commonly learns these crazy things about his world that he then pockets for later, it wasn't entirely out of the question that he would just do the same here. That he wouldn't just look at the mural, go gee lion this gem stuff sure is puzzling, and then go help sour cream reinvent dubstep or whatever. But instead, the episode doesn't do this. First, allowing Steven to process the lapis developments, and then... Lion, I need you to take me to Pearl. And then this lead is followed up on after the commercial, and this twist gets to last for the average viewer for maybe about 10 minutes. I do understand that it feels hypocritical to complain about the show doing these huge hiatuses and just ignoring plot points for dozens of episodes, while also wanting a break before the next one, but allowing the entirety of this episode to be engulfed by the most discussable quarter hour of the show is honestly scheduling malpractice, but compared to what the network would pull in the next decade, I guess it's not entirely surprising. Anyway, enough complaining about things that don't at all impact people watching the show today. To just wrap up the Pink Diamond stuff here, it's great. The next video I make on this show will be about that following episode, so I'll touch on it a bunch more then, but it's a really terrific little teaser that's somewhat sloppily attached to this final Lapis episode. Speaking of which, while the Blue Gem will obviously have moments in the last few episodes of the show, and an outing in future that's underwhelming at best, this is really the last solid look at Lapis Lazuli that we get, and I think the final place they take the character is pretty neat. And while there is definitely an anxiety angle to the story, with Lapis being too afraid of getting hurt to allow herself a chance at finding joy having some pretty clear parallels, I actually find this arc most interesting relative to the rest of the Lapis stuff from the show. Somewhat unfairly ignoring the time that she spends as Paradox's comedic partner, Lapis's two main story arcs revolve around her having to deal with both her time in the mirror and as Malachite, as well as the complicated feelings that arise in the aftermath of those situations. And while the specifics of those stories are really terrific to explore, like her urge to reunite with Jasper despite their time together, I think the Lapis that we see in this episode works as a nice cap to everything she's gone through. After so much trauma, it's just impossible for her to experience joy in the same way she sees others doing, and she just can't deal with it. And even though the story is never quite given the conclusion it deserves, with her getting like a cool moment and a half and reunited before she's assumed cured in time for the finale, I think this episode serves as the epitome of her presence in the series. While undeniably unlikable at times, Lapis Lazuli throws the show and the audience a final curveball. A curveball that simply gets more and more interesting the longer you watch it spin. Anyway, that's about it for me. If you want to see my excuses for when that A Single Pale Rose video takes way too long, you can find my Twitter hidden somewhere in the description. But either way, this has been Ample Samuel, and I'll see you in a week with a little trip back in time. Thanks for watching. Thank you.